You all are just as excited about the six traits, and I speak for myself when I say that writing is my favorite subject, but I know that you come from a variety of different subjects, so could I just hear um, a couple of quick introductions, maybe, of what sort of background you have, and any challenges or goals you have when it comes to teaching the six traits? Sounds great. Yeah, I think that it's awesome you guys are all really working with um, students for this amount of time on writing specifically. And I'm sure that your students um, appreciate the chance to improve their writing so much. To tell you a little bit about myself and how I came into this whole um, thing with writing and professional development, I actually started writing when I was around four years old. Just would um, get out these pieces of paper and write ceaselessly. And then when I was seven, I published my first book, Flying Fingers, uh, which I have right here. And I titled it mastering the tools of learning through the joy of writing because I really felt that writing was crucial to my learning and I hope to other students as well. That was also around the same time that I developed my goal of improving students' literacy and level learning and going around and giving presentations at elementary schools. I definitely give a lot of credit to the first teachers and principals who took this little diminutive seven-year-old seriously when she called up and said, hey, I want to teach your students about reading and writing. And that was really where my presenting and teaching began. So since that time, I've taught around 500 schools and classrooms around the world through video conferencing like this or through in-person visits. And one of my most commonly requested programs is all about the six traits of good writing. Because as we're seeing, and as you all have undoubtedly seen, the six traits are really key to effective writing and also to how students are evaluated with benchmarks on state tests all around the nation. So I've seen a lot of increase in use of those in lit classes. And I found that students really like them as far as the easy checklist for how they know that they have effective control in their writing. So, um, as we Excuse me, Adora. Yeah. Um, your voice is kind of um, garbled. We're having a hard time understanding. Do um, you think that maybe your microphone is too sensitive? Maybe you can turn down the sensitivity a little bit. That might help. Sure, let me check that. One second. Um, I apologize. Hmm. Oh, no problem. I just don't want So I raised the volume on the microphone. Did that improve it at all? Is the are you hearing it a little better right now? Uh, it kind of sounds like it's in a tin can. Uh oh. All right. One second. Um, I will try to do an alternative. I should have a spare microphone and plug in one, and maybe that would help if I hold it a little bit closer. Hopefully, the volume would be better and it'd be less garbled. Um, I'll just grab that. Sorry about that. No problem. I'll try this one. Um,
Hmm. I'm not sure if this microphone, if the input is actually taking or I'm trying to switch it out in audio settings. Are you hearing me any better right now? Yes, I'm able to hear you. Are you able to hear me? We can't hear you now. We see you speaking, but we can't hear you. You can't hear me. Um, is, is the audio... I don't... I, I checked the audio off, too. Do you see that Skype thing? Uh, we're getting sound now. Oh, okay. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Perfect. Is it... Does it sound better? Oh, oh it just cut out. <laughs> it cut out? Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, we cannot hear you. Hmm. That's not good. We're not getting any sound. Oh, Aston, hmm. Aston. Are you are you getting any sound now? Ask them to try the live stream. Yeah. No. Um. What about what about now? Now we still can't. Still hear. none. Sorry. Try, try live stream. Okay. Hmm. Try it. Yeah, it is coming through. Yeah, um. Ah, now you can hear it, it seems, and when you pick it up, it goes out. That's super strange. Okay, so you're hearing me now. Yes. I'll, I'm going to try that then. I'll just project a little bit more since I'm not holding it. It might be difficult. I'm really unsure about why that would be, but um, okay, sure. If, Perfect. Well, as long as it works, then I guess we can keep it up like this. And if at any time my audio does cut out, which it shouldn't, I don't think it's a network issue since the bandwidth is pretty good. Um, but if I do cut out, then you can go to livestream.com slash dorisvtalk, and it'll have the live stream there, and the audio should work fine. So with that, are we ready to continue with the presentation? Yes. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm not sure how much uh, you heard right before I cut out or when it was becoming garbled, but I just really like the six traits for how easy they make it for us students to be able to check ourselves in our work and also have um, a real something to look at when we're doing through peer editing. So the first thing I wanted to start with was just asking you about your previous work with the six traits and um, how much you're familiar with them. So raise your hand if you feel like you can comfortably list off all the six traits, define them, maybe give an example of where they would appear in writing, for instance. I'm seeing a couple raised hands. Okay, great. So I'm sure that you're probably familiar with the basic names of these. So ideas and content, organization, voice, sentence fluency, word choice, and conventions. I don't think they need to be in particular order, at least I'm hoping not. And they're fairly, uh, at least from what I can see, pretty matter of fact, which is nice. I think that that's another one of the great things about it, being user friendly for students in a way. And I feel like one of the crucial things is that students are able to look at that list and define them and understand them just as much as the teachers, because understanding on both sides of the rubric ensures that we're also able to replicate those traits in our own work. So when it comes to helping students understand the six traits and what they really look like in writing, that can start with some uh, recognition of where they appear. And it also needs to start with addressing the motivation issue. If students are like, well, you know, why do we need to learn this? I'm not going to be an English major when I go to college. I'm not going to really be a writer or anything. Why should I do this? 
then really emphasizing where the six traits appear, where effective writing appears in the real world, and where real world opportunities exist for us to use the six traits and effective writing, I think can be super useful. One of the activities that I did with some students um, in a presentation was asking what do you want to be when you grow up? And then we were all brainstorming as to how writing would be used even in these really strange professions that might seem like you would never use writing. I think somebody even threw in lumberjack just to try to kind of see if there was any way that you could use writing in that and we came up with some pretty interesting responses. So yeah, as far as the motivation issue for the six traits, really bringing it further than just this is what you need to do well on a test I feel is important. The other thing is recognition. Asking students where do you see the six traits? Not only maybe effective word choice on a menu to make certain foods look more appealing, for instance, or good control of voice when someone is telling a story from their life, but also, for instance, organization. You see that all the time if somebody has an outline. If a piece of writing is easy to follow, you can understand where it's going. Or sentence fluency. Where do you notice varied sentence choices? Where do you notice that somebody is really making a concerted effort to not make something awkward, to make the writing flow. These are all things that students can look at a piece of writing and find. I think that that's super important because we won't know how to approach our own writing and develop the six traits if we don't know what the traits themselves look like when used effectively. So here's an activity idea that I think would be really fun to try with a group of students maybe as a writing journaling activity. We'd be going on a scavenger hunt for the six traits in writing. It could be a magazine, a newspaper, it could be a book that students are reading already perhaps in literature or one of their choice, and just asking, hey, go through here, find good sentence structure, good word choice, excellent development of ideas and content. Where do you see a writer taking that topic sentence and really using evidence effectively or taking an image and supporting it with description? There are all kinds of examples where students can ask themselves these questions, and if you make it like a scavenger hunt, kind of everybody's checking them off, maybe trying to get to all six traits the fastest, have it be like a little bit of an in-class competition or a group activity, that could be really fun. And of course you might want to vary this depending on what grades you're working with. So do you all work with um, a wide range of grades, or do you each have a specific grade that you work with? Wide range of grades. Okay, so it's um, 7 through 10, right? 7 through 12, wow, okay, so really wide range. And what would you say are kind of the challenges at different grade levels for the students? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Motivation. Motivation, okay, addressing motivation. And um, so what are some of the discussions you've had with students so far about motivation? Sounds like a really great way to bring in that cross-curricular connection. And I know that for me, like I'm um, in an AP Lang class, and for us, when we compare this year's class to what we heard from seniors about last year's, they were doing like a musical, lots of art pieces. There was a lot more um, opportunity to be creative in the projects, and they really liked that and felt more motivated. This year, we're doing a lot more like practice tests, worksheets, and it's a lot less. I feel that where we're walking the class and forward to it. So I think that it's awesome that you're really bringing art into it and making that part of the equation. Any other ideas for how you're addressing motivation with students? Okay, well, I definitely think that um, bringing in other cross-curricular connections like what we saw with art, you could do it with science, with mathematics, with history really effectively, just giving students the chance to play to their strengths when it comes to language arts and showing them that, hey, English class isn't necessarily just about English, it really has applications all across the board. That can be immensely motivating, especially if students know what they want to do and it's something that doesn't seem to have anything to do with English at first. And another thing is really finding these examples of what effective writing looks like and how it has helped people become influential because if you look at 
one of the president's speeches, or if you look at any piece of writing by famous scientists or inventors or what have you, then they're always using these effective tactics, at least somewhere. So having students identify these, go on kind of a scavenger hunt, could be a great step towards recognition of what the six traits look like in writing. And here's a group project that I think would be really fun to do for developing understanding, and we're going to try this as if we were students, just work collaboratively on this. And this would be one where you could divide a class into groups of maybe two to five people per, and each group would tackle a trait, whether voice, conventions, um, sentence structure, etc., and give them a couple days to make a poster, a PowerPoint, a song, a skit, a prezi about the trait that they've chosen to teach the class about the trait. And what they could do then is sort of taking what they know from their scavenger hunt activity of examples of writing that effectively use control of the traits, then they could show these pieces, they might write some of their own examples, and they would also create an example of ineffective use of the trait. Now, why you might think when well, you have students do this seems really contrary to learning about what the trait would look like, well this is actually one of my favorite parts. When I'm preparing for a presentation on the six traits for a group of students, and I get to write these examples of terrible word choice, where it'll be like, Mrs. Gibbon's house is big and ugly, my house is big and ugly, my neighbor's house is pink and ugly, or what have you, and then we work to improve it together as a collaborative exercise, and your students could do the same thing with sentence structure, word choice, ideas and content, come up with an example that really shows this needs improvement, and work together to have this collaborative editing activity. So why don't we try this right now for, let's say, word choice. Um, if we were a group of students and we had to make a PowerPoint or write a song about word choice to explain it effectively to the rest of the class, how do you think we would start? Okay. I'm sorry? Explain the subject and the topic. Great. So. Uh, we might ask ourselves also, what do we want to do? So, should we write a song? Should we make a PowerPoint? Any, any thoughts? Yeah. Let's write a song. Awesome. I love that uh, you guys are up for the challenge. Because when I was thinking of this activity, I was thinking, you know, how would you reach out to students who are really more musically inclined? And I thought writing a song would be a very creative way to do that. So, I'm going to open up a Word document and we'll start typing up this song about word choice. I think this is this would be an awesome challenge. I have never personally written a song about one of the six traits, so I would love to do this as a student to explain to the rest of the class. I think it would be really fun if a group of kids is also doing it, you know, having different roles within the song. So, yeah, why don't we start? First of all, for maybe our chorus or the opening line, how do we explain word choice succinctly and maybe if we can in a way that would rhyme? I'm sorry? <laughs> Alright, so let's see, we, we might have, I'm trying to think out loud here, perhaps I'll um, open up, maybe I'll write it with the pen actually. Okay, so. so this might be a little bit hard to see, sorry, my writing isn't super big. I've just written word choice, uh, I'll write a second line. It's how you show your voice. Honestly, I came up with that just because it rhymes. I will admit that was sort of a terrible second line, but we can bring this a little further. What do you not want when you're thinking about what good word choice looks like versus bad word choice? What do you not want? Simple adjectives. Simple adjectives, okay. So maybe stay away from... There's nothing that rhymes with simple, is there? 
Well, we can we can think about that later. So, so maybe like don't use simple adjectives all the time. Sorry, my handwriting is abysmal. I should just go and become a doctor instead of a writer. Repetition. What rhymes with repetition? Repetition, <laughs> repetition rhymes with repetition. <laughs> we could we could add repetition, repetition, repetition. See how annoying that. There's really nothing else besides repetition, is there? Well, I guess it would. Um, I'll just put quotes here to indicate that repeats. Actually, yeah, that would be good for a course. Don't want too much repetition. Don't want too much repetition. It would probably get drilled into people's heads that you should not use the same words over and over again. But what else with word choice do we think about? How do we drive good word choice? So students are thinking, all right, I understand. I don't want to use the same words over and over again. I don't want to use the simple adjective, but what do I do instead? So how can our song kind of address that too? Great. So replace or maybe um, use use what you've got, your sensory details. What else? So we have sensory details. What are some other ways we can get students to th think about good word choice? Use a thesaurus. Okay. Is there any possible way we can have a line about a thesaurus rhyme with details? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, let's see. Use what you've got, your sensory details. The The thesaurus makes it interesting for us. Oh, I see what you did there. Okay. Sorry, I'm a little slow on the uptake sometimes. <laughs> so, I have turned, that's kind of denigrated a chicken scratch, but what I will say is this is, for considering it's our first draft, we weren't trying that hard to rhyme, like at least between lines, and the fact that we've been kind of limited to the size of the slide, we have a pretty solid first stanza here at least. Word choice, it's how you show your voice. Don't use simple adjectives all the time. Don't want too much repetition. Don't want too much repetition. Don't want too much repetition. <laughs> use what you've got, your sensory details. The thesaurus makes it interesting for us. And the students could continue. It sounds really bad when I'm doing it as, as a solo and the fact that I cannot rap to save my life, but let's say you have one person laying down a beat and you have another person rapping this and they're switching off. I think everybody would laugh. I think everybody would have a good time and more importantly, they would remember some of the key things. Don't want too much repetition if it was actually you know, catchy and repeated like five times until people got annoyed. They would realize, whoa, this is what I'm doing in my writing when I use the same words over and over again. And it wouldn't necessarily have to be something as, in a way, kind of silly and fun as a song. It could be a more serious PowerPoint or a really artistic poster. It would really be up to the individual groups. They could maybe do a video, but I think that this would be a good way for students to explore in depth, wow, what is this trait? What does it look like? What does, 
something, what is something bad, like for instance too much repetition would be on the bad side of word choice, how can I do something good using sensory details, using a thesaurus to find those synonyms? And if they have this kind of problem, solution, definition in their presentation, not only would they get a deeper understanding, but their peers as well. And whenever you give students the chance to do this peer-to-peer -peer teaching and learning, I feel like that's empowering. So win-win for everybody. Of course, it would look different depending on how much time you have in your classes, how big the groups would be, how old the students are, all that. But it would be possible to do in class as a collaborative activity as we just did, or as a more independent assignment. To speak to that point of collaboration, I feel like one of the major threads that has run through all my presentations that I do around writing especially, it's always been one of working together. And because I'm so close in age to a lot of the students with whom I'm working, I feel like it definitely helps break down that barrier, uh, barrier. And we feel like we're working on the same assignment, we're writing the same prompt. That's one of the funnest things because they realize, wow, you know, even though she's teaching us this stuff, she's also learning with us. So as teachers, if you actually write with your students, and if you say, hey, I edit my writings, I go along, I can make mistakes too and change them, just like you, I improve my writing by doing it constantly, then students will see you as a role model and really think, wow, my teacher is invested in this and is working with me. The second thing is that I know this personally more because of math. When I'm learning a concept, like I was just working on absolute value and inequalities, and my goodness, it took me forever. I was reading it, and or I was like reading about it, and I feel like, you know, the information stuck somewhere, but then I would get to a problem and I would be like, now how does all that information that I just memorized really translate to this problem? I know that there are students who feel the same way about writing. They will hear the song about word choice. They will understand, okay, I know what I don't want to do. I know what I do want to do, but then they look at a piece of paper and they're having difficulty really coming up with the ideas. So that's where collaboration can come in. If you open up a PowerPoint or you open up a Word document, just throw it on the projector and say, hey class, today we're going to work on this together or you have an example of a piece of writing that really needs improvement and you work on it together, that's something that I've found has been really effective at getting students from point A to point B to the point where they can edit and write their own work more effectively. So, to give an example, um, I'll just open up a Word document or, um, let's see, I could make a new slide perhaps and give an example of that. So in this example of writing, we see that there's kind of this basic idea happening. The treehouse is fun, I built it two months ago, I like playing there, my neighbors like it too, come to my treehouse. It's sort of a little bit narrative, and toward the end it's persuasive where it's basically telling the reader, come to my treehouse. It's maybe somebody writing a letter to a friend to invite them, it could be just about anything. But where we're seeing areas of improvement are areas around the six traits. You might ask students, if they're not immediately spotting some things that could be improved, you might ask them more specific questions like, where do you think the sentence structure here could be improved? Do you think that there is a variety of types of sentences, or are all the sentences mostly the same? And they'll see that, yeah, these sentences are pretty much the same. There aren't a whole lot of complex sentences. It's mostly just these short sentences. I, I, my neighbors, you know. Another thing is they might look at ideas and content and say, well, it could be developed a little bit more. This whole idea of the treehouse is fun. What makes it fun? What are some sensory details that show how fun it is? How do you feel when you walk around inside? So imagine for a second that you're students, and I just ask you, how can we improve by adding details to this? What are some details we could add to show that the treehouse is fun? Any ideas? Descriptive adjectives, great. So this big tree house of your dreams, what is a descriptive adjective that would describe it? I'm hoping that your seventh through twelfth graders are not quite as recalcitrant as this because I could see where it would be a little bit difficult to keep going. Um, yeah, I know how high schoolers can be, though. 
When it comes to throwing out descriptive adjectives, if maybe not a lot of people are raising their hands, have them work on an individual activity where they're, write, where they're making a list of some adjectives, see who can get the most, collect the papers, or ask them to share. And so we could take something like the Treehouse is Fun, a student makes a list of adjectives that we could either switch fun out with, since fun is a pretty overused word that would speak to word choice, or to develop the ideas and content more by adding detail, we could think what makes the Treehouse Fun adjectives that support funness of the treehouse. And I would go over here and add something like this. Oh, okay, so let's... I just realized that honestly, it's kind of unlikely that if you ask seventh graders what makes a treehouse fun, they will say picturesque views of the scenery. Uh, that sounds more like a real estate advertisement. However, <laughs> when you get some more creative things from your 7th through 12th graders, probably with an example that's maybe a little bit more <laughs> grown up, um, or one that's, you could do one that's more fun, a spaceship, whatever, then you could take something like this, expand out, and show students as you're working on it right in front of them with their input, hey, this is how we just went from something that was kind of blah, didn't have a whole lot of development, we went and added some details, look at how this piece of writing has changed. When it really comes to life in front of them, and you noticed there that I was having second thoughts about what I was writing, I was backspacing quite a bit. When they see that from teachers, I think it actually makes them respect the craft of writing and how much it changes as you do it a lot more. Definitely, I would love to see my teachers write more in front of us and really work with us on that collaborative level. It makes it more equal and it also emphasizes the importance of editing and uh, really working through it as you go. So, taking a piece of writing that needs improvement, collaborating with students, on it, on all the different traits, or focusing on one either way, I think that's a really great way to show students and to make something come alive. So, go back to the presentation. Now, you've done these collaborative activities, students have recognized what the six traits are, maybe done a song or a skit about them to illustrate them to their classmates. How do they replicate it in their writing? How do they replicate it in their writing when they're taking a high stakes state test or in an essay that they need to hand in? Well, practice, practice, practice. Some might do this through writing every day or doing a journal, maybe, that they have updated with assignments weekly. I think that writing journals can be a really great way of enforcing students' practice, and I personally have found them really useful. Another thing is that, let's say you're doing this writing journal, you want to make sure that variety is really kept up and is consistent because students will get really tired of doing the same prompts or the same type of writing day after day or week after week. Despite the fact that you might see a lot of the same types of writing being tested on a state test or that are required at the high school level from students, I know it's been a really long time, for instance, since I've ever been required to hand in a poem or a short story, I think it is equally important to give students the chance to explore those types of writing because sometimes a student who might have a very difficult time developing their word choice in a formal research essay will be able to find that spark and really go after their ability to do that in a poem or some other form of writing. So another idea as far as real world participation, National Novel Writing Month is in November, it's a little late to join now perhaps. but for future years if students wanted to begin work on a novel to develop their use of the six traits, or if they wanted to start writing an epic poem. You know, these would all, I think, be equally valid ways of developing their writing skills, some activities that they could do in their writing journal, just mixing it up a little bit and giving the students the chance to discover what works well for them and how they can effectively control their um, the six traits in different types of writing. Other opportunities for real world writing, and I think that this addresses the motivation issue a lot, I talk to my fellow students and sometimes they'll say, oh, I didn't really work on blank assignment because I know the teacher doesn't really read it, she'll just check for completeness and grade it. Or, I didn't work very hard on this because the teacher doesn't care that much. Or, sometimes 
the idea that just one person is reading your work and then it's going to go to the bottom of your backpack and never be seen again, that's not super motivating for most students. So giving a motivation that has more to do with perhaps a larger audience or an issue that a student cares about can be really key to motivating them to improve their writing. So, for instance, the Huffington Post launched a teen section where teens can write in and submit editorials. That could be a great place to start writing a petition about an important issue that they care about, maybe asking students, hey, what's something in your community that needs to be fixed? So it's something at school that you care deeply about, or something in the nation or the world even. Whether you want to think local or global, um, definitely doing research, maybe writing a petition for change.org. And then you would ask students to evaluate their own writing and each other's writing based on those six traits. Whenever you expand the audience so that it's beyond the audience of one, the teacher, to an audience of maybe 20 people in a class, or even 200 in a school, or 2,000, or even larger with a blog online or a petition, or any sort of writing that has the possibility to gain larger audiences, then students will realize, wow, the writing I do, it's not only for me, it's not only for my teacher, it's not only for a grade in class or a score on a test. Writing is the mark that I am able to have on the world, and there is nothing more motivating than that. So when we look at the six traits, it's important for students and teachers alike, I think, to realize that it's not just about producing better writing. It's about producing better citizens, producing better students overall, and better learners. So that's why I've been really I'm invested in teaching the six traits. I have lots of videos on YouTube that students and teachers have been watching, presentations where I go through all the... Uh, here are a couple examples, so like my presentation on voice, and again, asking students really from the start to recognize where the six traits happen, what effective control of them looks like, and how the six traits are really crucial not only to the writing that we do for school, but also every day. And whenever it connects with students on that personal level, they have the chance to draw real-world connections, to have a larger audience, and to even do some really fun activities like writing a song or making a Venn diagram, connecting it to art, as you mentioned, I think that that is awesome for a writing class. So I don't doubt that your students are going to have an amazing experience working with the six traits and different types of writing in your classes. I just wanted to ask you if there are any questions that you might have or objectives that you're trying to reach with students that you're not seeing happening quite yet. I honestly feel like the, the reason I raise my hand in class so much these days is because I have the utmost sympathy for my teachers. <laughs> Especially, um, yeah, asking a question and not receiving too many raised hands. It's an interesting feeling. How would you say your students are as far as participating in class and really being motivated and interested in writing? They're pretty shy. Okay, and are there any activities that you've specifically worked on to draw them out in other ways? Yeah, I you talk about making it for with them and uh and to do that to make connections um, with the writing with them. I have to do that that day. Uh, but one thing I'm having trouble with is uh, organization with them. Again, when when we start in essays they automatically shut down with organization. You know, getting something on paper and Interesting. Yeah, no, for me it's funny because I found that a lot of times the students I've worked with, they've grown up with a lot of organization and their problem is almost that they'll start with the outline before they have the idea. So it's interesting to hear about the situation with your students. I think that it's important to kind of make a differentiation between, hey, here's where we brainstorm and here's when we actually start writing. If students don't have enough of a line between that where they think, oh, I'll just start writing my ideas out and that's kind of my first draft and that might be an issue. Really, um, I think making sure that students understand, hey, you can write down all your ideas. In fact, go crazy, write down everything. But now you need to take that and it's almost like a filter where you bring it through, you find what's relevant and you stack it up. Visuals can help a lot with that. Maybe having students um, develop a presentation where they're saying like, you could use the analogy of a set of stairs or a house, whatever you might use for the type of writing they're doing, whether it's persuasive or narrative, I'm not sure. And just working with students to develop a series of steps as they maybe sit down and start a piece of paper. I think that that methodical approach could work really well. And also giving pieces of writing that are not very organized and doing a collaborative activity. So like, for instance, the one that we did with 
the treehouse only imagine if there was just no organization whatsoever it was completely like sentences were in random places and asking students okay let's take this piece of writing and let's organize it now why don't we do that from step one next time when we sit down with that so this might be some different things to do um, that's really interesting the struggle with organization anything else I'm sorry? Yeah, they're scared to write about themselves. They're scared to write about themselves. Yeah, we're writing essays about they're they're describing themselves, they're using descriptive details, they're describing themselves, um, you know, inward and outward traits that they're they're trying to express in their essay. Yeah, they're not 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 they're I can definitely empathize with that. I feel like especially when you're in the kind of middle school, high school environment, you feel a lot of times like you're not quite sure how you should look at yourself and how other people's perceptions should kind of shape your view of yourself. But I think one thing that might be interesting to do would uh, be having students fill out kind of a character description sheet, almost the same way that you might take a character from a fictional novel and ask students to analyze it, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and ask students to think of themselves as characters in a book, and what would they be, like as if they were the main character, and think of a conflict kind of, how they respond to it, their traits, and if that doesn't work, it might be interesting to kind of pair people up in groups of two or three, and say, now kind of trade off, like write down some words and pick out the ones that you feel describe each other, and that could be a fun way not only for students to sort of bond with each other, but also understand, all right, here's, here's a maybe slightly less subjective view of me. It could, I guess, go either way, but yeah, I think um, taking away students' fear of writing about themselves also it has a lot to do with confidence, and making sure that students realize every single one of your stories is worth telling, that just because you don't you know, live in Hollywood and go have crazy parties every night or whatever you might see in stories that you enjoy reading about other young people, you know, that doesn't make your stories any less interesting. I've definitely seen that, the issue when I'm working with students on personal narrative, that they feel like, oh, I shouldn't write about myself because I'm not interesting enough or people won't really enjoy reading this, so taking away that um, lack of confidence issue, I feel, would also be important. Okay, uh, do you have any tips as far as uh Tips for getting shy students to stand up in front of the class. That's a good one. I have a little bit of a harder time, I will admit, empathizing with that because I've never been exactly shy. Definitely I've been like the first to volunteer on lots of occasions, but I will say that a lot of times it's the, the worst enemy of, of, of those students isn't so much that necessarily the judgment of other students as it is the voice in their head saying, oh, but you'll make a mistake, you'll fail, and other students will judge you. I think that it can, um, one thing that is really effective is taking grades out of a, you know, standing up in front of the class activity where it really is more for practice, where students still, like, understand that it's required, they need to do it, but where there's a little bit less of maybe a um, penalty attached, so they don't have the stress of, oh, what if I flunk this or something attached? That could be one thing. Another thing is, um, that's worked really well. I really like Socratic seminars where everybody gets called on and where they can kind of call on each other and having a discussion about an issue that uh, maybe a book or a chapter or something, a trait that would that people would be able to have a bit of a discourse about. Sometimes if they're in smaller groups, it would work a little better and then within the group they could speak up maybe as a start instead of in front of the whole class. And, hmm, yeah, shy students Really making sure that they're that they have a topic that they can speak about that, that they're passionate about or a personal narrative, whatever they're writing about, and that they feel like it's a supportive environment as opposed to a judging one. But I'm sure that you've probably made steps in those directions already. So I think that what it ultimately takes is I need to understand what it, what exactly it means to be a shy student on a more visceral level. Okay. Um,
Sure. I would say that teaching the six traits of writing, that honestly, you shouldn't think, I'm not an English teacher, you know, this is going to be a whole lot harder, because when it comes down to it, the six traits of writing are pretty universal. As long as we read and as long as we write, we can understand and recognize and apply them. And really, I think working with students on a collaborative level and showing them, hey, you know, I'm learning, I'm recognizing, I'm doing all these same things as you are, can be incredibly empowering to both students and teachers and inspiring the students. I also feel like if you want to ask students to practice, which I think is a super important part of it, and to be doing writing journals, that it's important for students to see you writing. And that's something that not even a lot of English teachers necessarily do in the classroom at a regular, uh, or at least um, regularly. And so those would be two tips, just I think really showing students that you're in, you're, that you're in it together, and also make, uh, taking advantage of the fact that you guys come from a diverse range of subject backgrounds, making cross-curricular connections would be really essential. I mean, we heard an excellent example of how that's working with art, and I think it could work really, really well with science, with PE, and I, since I come from this writing background, I would love to see that being done with more classes. So using your backgrounds as a strength rather than a weakness can really be super effective. Well, thank you so much for your attention, um, your questions. Are there any other things that I can address? Thank you very much. Hope you have a wonderful day and a um, great Veterans Day weekend. Well, I have one more question. Oh, yes. Um, I noticed when um, I was sent the YouTube videos that you do on YouTube with all five minutes and that's easy to make that it's equally intelligible. Is that correct? Yes. I do a lot of videos on YouTube about the six traits. Actually, if your students are looking for any more resources or would like to watch videos, I have quite a lot of those up on word choice, ideas, and content. I think there should be a few on organization and conventions as well. And those are all viewable at youtube.com slash Adoris Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Hope you enjoy and the, the students are able to benefit from that. I really appreciate it and I greatly admire the work that you do around writing. I know that a lot of teachers would definitely think, wow, you know, English is not my subject or whatever, and um, I know that your students are benefiting amazingly from having the opportunity to work with you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.